Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special Spotlight Series event about the impact of philanthropy on cardiology. My name is Sue Hunt, and it's my great privilege to be the Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation. And you're all welcome, one and all. Can I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather? For us here tonight, it's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who may be with us on the event tonight. To begin, I'd also like to welcome Professor Michael Chung, who's the Director of the Cardiology Department and Acting Chief of Surgery at, here at the RCH. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, Michael's unable to join me here in the studio tonight. However, he's joining us live from his office, thanks to the wonders of technology. Hey, Michael. Amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> it is. Warm welcome to you all at home who are joining us online. And while we wish we were able to uh, meet together uh, and you could join us in person, we're so grateful that you were able to join us this evening for the Spotlight series. We've got a terrific number of people on the call and I thank everybody for taking the time out. Also due to the current uh, COVID-19 situation in Victoria, we have some presentations to show you from Professor Matt Saban, who's the Royal Children's Hospital uh, Chief Medical Officer and Executive Sponsor of RCH Healthcare Philanthropy, and our specialist cardiology team, Dr Jacob Matthew, who's a paediatric cardiologist, Ms Caitlin Elliott, who's cardiology nurse unit manager, and Dr Emmy Kowalski, who's paediatric cardiologist. So I'd like to welcome all of those speakers who are joining us from home. So you're just sitting, here I am in a studio all on my own and everybody is flung to the four winds. So we look forward to bringing you their presentations a little later. Our Spotlight series, ladies and gentlemen, is a curated series of events that provides an exclusive insight into the work of the hospital and celebrates the impact that philanthropy has had on that particular area of the hospital that we're showing you. Each event brings together experts in their field from a spotlighted department, which share the impact of how your generosity is making a change to the sick children and young people that they care for each and every day. So before we jump into it, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have live captioning for the event this evening, which you can view by clicking on the live transcript button in the menu bar below. The captions are automatically generated, so they won't be perfect, but let's hope they help you if you need them. And of course, this is an interactive session. We really want to hear from you during the night. And you can use the chat function to tell us your name and where you're from, and also to ask any questions. So you'll have that opportunity to ask questions later on. And we're also uh, lucky that our guest speakers, Jacob, Caitlin and Remy, are on the chat. So if you ask them a question, they'll be able to answer that in the chat and then we'll, we'll also be able to answer that here from the studio. So to kick us off, um, we have a video message from Professor Matt Saban, Chief Medical Officer and Executive Director of Medical Services and Clinical Governance at the RCH. So here's Matt. Hi, my name is Matt Sabin and I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Executive Director of Medical Services and Clinical Governance here at RCH. It's my great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the hospital to this very special spotlight on cardiology. Thank you so much for joining with us in this wonderful opportunity to hear about the role that philanthropy plays within the Department of Cardiology at RCH. I was particularly pleased to be asked to share a message of thanks with you, as I don't often have the chance to speak with such a dedicated and passionate group of donors, fundraisers and champions of our cause. In my role at RCH and through my interactions with the Department of Cardiology, I know the tremendous impact that philanthropy makes on delivering the best care to our children and young people. I'm proud to say the RCH is an international leader in the research and treatment of children presenting with complex cardiac conditions, and we're home to the National Paediatric Heart Transplant Centre, caring for patients requiring heart transplantation from all over Australia. The RCH Foundation and its donors are a critical enabler here on campus, and there are countless examples of that collaboration creating outstanding outcomes. In this presentation, you're going to hear about how far we've come with your support, from paying for life-changing equipment like ventricular assist devices that allow kids to be up and moving while waiting heart transplant, to funding music therapy for children on our Koala Ward, which helps make their stay with us a little less overwhelming. 
We'll also hear about the future of cardiac care at the RCH. What's the next innovation? What's the new frontier that the RCH will lead the way in? And how will philanthropy help take us there? I hope you enjoy this spotlight presentation and this insight into the outstanding work of the Department of Cardiology. My thanks and congratulations to Professor Michael Chung and his colleagues Remy Kowalski, Caitlin Elliott and Jacob Matthew, who you'll be shortly hearing from, for their dedication and incredible care of patients at RCH. Once again, on behalf of us all at the RCH, thank you so much for your generosity. Your philanthropy and fundraising has been integral to the effort to change the way that we diagnose and treat children with complex cardiac conditions. I hope to see you all again soon. Keep well and stay safe. Thank you, Matt. And we really appreciate your support, um, both at executive level and also for all of the work that you and your colleagues do at the RCH. Indeed, we look forward to, looking, to hearing from all of our speakers tonight. So to tell us more about the impact of philanthropy within the RCH and particularly the cardiology department, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Michael Chung. Professor Chung has been a paediatric cardiologist for more than 15 years and has trained at the leading congenital cardiac centres across the world, including Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital in London, the Royal Brompton in London, and the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and of course, here at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. As I said before, he's currently head of the department, he's, he's the director of cardiology, and he's also acting chief of surgery and leader of the heart research group at our campus partner, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight and uh, everybody else in the audience, albeit virtually. It is very sad in our times currently that we're not able to meet face to face, but uh, We'll see what we can do within the resources that we have. I, I must remember to update that bio, Sue. So I'm actually much older than that, 15 years of practicing cardiology now. I think it's probably closer to 20 or 25. But anyway, I'll take it. Thank you very much for that reminder. Um, I thought I might just show a few things um, within our department, which we're very excited about. Um, uh, and uh, we'll take you through some of the presentations uh, during the course of the next hour or so. But I was hoping that um, we had a video which we could show, Simon, if you're able to show our first video, um, of our Sharks video, to just set the scene.
thanks for showing that, Simon. I just wanted to thank Simon and his team for producing that amazing video. It's um, clearly, we did that a few years ago, pre-COVID, and uh, it reminds me of a few things. Firstly, um, perhaps the impact of what we do day to day, and we're fairly familiar with it. Um, we get a bit blasé about what we do perhaps at times, but also we have an amazing team of people around us to help us do that. So just to show you a few things, uh, I wanted to give a brief talk of some of the things that we do. Each year within Australia, well, these are the last figures for 2017 from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. There's around 300,000 births in Australia and 60,000 in New Zealand. And what that means for us then is that approximately 3,000 children are born each year with heart disease. That's about eight per day. Now, within Australia and New Zealand, that amounts to um, 2,700 cardiac operations performed in Australia and New Zealand. And our results are fairly comparable to international leaders within in the world, the mortality of about 2%. And that means then that heart disease is still the major cause, the most common single cause of death in infancy. And those are figures that we're continuing to try and improve. The, the slides are also slightly off the screen, unfortunately. I'm not quite sure why that is. I'm, I apologise for that. Um, we like to think of big things, and uh, we're fortunate in Melbourne that our centre is actually the, the biggest centre within uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, fortunately, it seems to have cut off the other two centres, which are our next biggest centres being Sydney and Brisbane. But essentially, our, our unit provides care for all of the children in Victoria who need cardiac interventions. But also we cover South Australia, most of Northern Territory, as well as Victoria. So approximately one third of children in Australia come to the Children's Hospital in Melbourne for advanced cardiac care. And as Sue said earlier on, and um, Matt said earlier on, sorry, we are the National Heart Transplant Centre for Australia's children. So great care everywhere is something that the hospital aspires to. And we have a great care triangle, which we're very focused on in trying to improve. All these different elements of our great care triangle are important for us when we're thinking about how we look after children, with children and their families at the centre of that. And clearly clinical excellence, a safe place both for families but also for staff is important, access to care and increasingly we need to think about sustainability of, um, of health care. For us perhaps it's reflected however in our triangle of the campus partners in addition to RCH Foundation supporting us overall clearly with the hospital we are also closely aligned with the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and also the university. And I think that reflects the three elements of care, research and education, which I'd like to focus on this evening uh, with our presenters. So how has the foundation supported cardiology specifically? Well, we have a vast uh, number of donors, some of whom may be on um, this presentation this evening. Uh, we've had long-term support from our RCH auxiliaries, um, particularly the heartthrob auxiliary and CPR. We also get donations from schools and families, and they're amazing to receive when we have a small group of children in the class donating to us. We also have donations from Finland's Gift, RCH 1000. Heart Kids Australia has also been a long-term supporter of us. And Nissan, Nissan Financial Services. Uh, we have um, RCH ward bed sponsors um, throughout the hospital. And we're also fortunate to have um, uh, individual groups such as Olivia's Gift, Abigail Haven, Palm Memorial Fund and Lucia Crinis. I haven't clearly named all the other people who have very kindly supported us and the foundation over the years. The three elements of uh, support then largely have centred in research and those are some of the topics that we're interested in um, uh, exploring. Um, education and we've had education of our ICU nurses as well as international cardiology fellows. I think, you know, when we consider how we stand within the region, our hospital now, whilst we might be a big centre in Australia and New Zealand, is actually not a very big unit in, in Asia when we consider ourselves or compare ourselves to India or China. 
But what we do provide is great quality of care. And that's something that I think we should be leading with, uh, with education for fellows within the region. The third element is equipment. And whilst Australian hospitals are very well supported uh, for equipment and services, there are certain elements of equipment that we, we require to push the boundaries. And you'll hear a bit about that from, from Jacob this evening. The clinical care um, area that I'd like um, you to hear about this evening is um, something called the Ventricular Assist Device Program. And I don't want to spoil um, Jacob's talk, but essentially this is an artificial um, heart system that supports children through to transplantation. And it's allowed us to look after um, children or very many more heart, uh, children needing heart transplant over the past few years. Our first hardware systems uh, were supported through the foundation. We wouldn't have been able to do that without the foundation support. The second element that um, we'll hear from Caitlin about is leadership, education and training. And clearly, as in we've recognised within healthcare over the years and perhaps even more during the COVID pandemic, our people are incredibly valuable to us. We can have all the equipment in the world, the best equipment, but we need the people. And one of the elements that I would like to push through is empowerment of our nurses. Our nurses clearly know our systems very well. Um, unfortunately, with the hierarchy within hospital systems, our nurses aren't able to enact on that as much as they should and have been able to around the world in other centres. And you'll hear a bit about that from Caitlin. And then the third element we'll hear about is research. And Remy will talk a little bit about how Foundation has supported us with a new software to um, help us with our advanced imaging techniques. This is one other area where we're interested in um, researching is protecting the heart and brain during heart surgery. And we've just completed a study that's been published using a compound, using a drug, which reduces the amount of injury to the heart muscle by 40% just by infusing a compound at the time of surgery. So that's something that's very exciting for us. So that's probably enough from me, um, but those, these are the three elements that I'd like our uh, presenters to give you an insight into and a window into what we do. Pushing the boundaries of clinical care, supporting and developing our people, and some of the elements of research which we're doing. So the first presentation um, is going to be from Jacob, uh, Dr. Jacob Matthew. And we, as we said before, these are going to be through video, um, uh, but the guys are online to answer questions when uh, the time comes. So if we could play the first video from Jacob, please. Thank you. So my name's Jacob Matthew. I'm one of the cardiologists here at the Royal Children's, and I'm responsible for uh, the ventricular assist device program. And I'd like to thank you for coming today and giving us the opportunity to share a little bit about what it is that we do. Now, I understand that there will be many people in this audience that have lived this journey and need no introduction, but I'd like the rest of you to imagine that you've just been told that your previously healthy child has had some vague tummy symptoms and breathing difficulties for a few weeks in fact has got a serious heart problem and is in heart failure. You and your whole family are now on a path like this one and you're not quite sure where it will lead, but instinctively you can see that there's danger around. This is the journey faced by many of the children and families who meet the Royal Children's Hospital heart failure team each year. Where this journey will lead is a little bit like an iceberg. Thankfully, for most children, medications can help to stabilise or improve their heart failure, and developments in screening and genetic technologies have allowed us to find those children at an earlier stage of their illness when they're more likely to respond to this sort of treatment. For many other children, we can leverage the breadth of expertise within the cardiology, surgery and ICU teams at Royal Children's Hospital to offer complex treatments like pacemaker therapies, arrhythmia procedures, and surgeries to treat complex congenital heart disease. And this sometimes is enough to stabilize these children. However, at the end of this, we're left with the children at the tip of the iceberg, those children for whom none of the prior options are successful. And for many of these children, 
heart transplant will be the best option. The road to transplant itself can be quite dangerous and this chart shows us what this journey looked like before 2005 and imagines what would happen to those patients who were listed for transplant at this time if no heart had come along on time. It's a slippery slope. By one month, 83% of the children who were originally listed are still alive and waiting, and by six months, only about half of the children who were initially listed for transplant were able to wait in good shape. Ultimately, the heart came along in time for only about two-thirds of the patients who were listed during this era in our program's history. So beginning in 2005, the ventricular assist device program was started and used ventricular assist devices, which are heart pumps, to help support the function of one or both sides of the heart and to help make this journey a little safer for the children we look after. In 2005, our first patient is shown here, Ryan, standing next to the driver unit for his adult-sized pump. This was called the Thoratec device. And you can see it's an enormous machine that uh, he needed to be tethered to and could easily be mistaken for something from the Sputnik program. By 2008, we extended our program and started using a device which we still use called the Berlin Heart, which is similar to the previous device, but is smaller and specifically designed for children. As our program evolved by 2013, we were able to extend the use of this technology to children under 10 kilos. And here we see young Ariel, who at the time was one of the smallest children in the world to be supported on this device at a mere 3 kilograms. She, in later years, would charm us all as the face of our Good Friday appeal. The following year, we introduced an adult device called the Heartware device, which was almost fully implantable within the body. And importantly, this meant that our children could be much more mobile with their VADs in place, and some had the option to be discharged from hospital while they're waiting for their transplant, which significantly improves their quality of life. The program has grown a lot with all of these developments, and in recent years we've supported 10 to 12 patients on a VAD in a typical year. And all of this has had a dramatic impact on outcomes for the children waiting for a transplant. As you'll remember, if a heart had not come along in time, 54% of our patients could expect to be alive and well and in reasonable conditions six months after listing. And overall, only about two-thirds were transplanted in time prior to 2005. As the VAD program matured between 2005 and 2012, the six-month survival improved to 76%. And since 2012, six-month survival has improved to 97% of the patients who were listed, and ultimately 97% of these patients got to transplant in time. The benefits of this therapy have extended beyond the wait list, however, and because these children usually arrive at transplant itself in much better physical condition than was possible previously, we've also seen a significant improvement in transplant survival. This graph shows a similar slippery slope that begins after transplantation itself, and the red line shows us those children who were transplanted before 2005. The green line here shows patients who were transplanted after 2012. Now, if we focus just on the first year after transplant, prior to 2000, 85% of the children we transplanted were alive and well a year after transplant, whereas now, because they are arriving at transplant itself in better condition in the VAD era, Fully 97% of these children are making it through the first year after transplant, and as you can see, do pretty well in the years after. Now to make a complex treatment like VAD therapy work, we have been fortunate to have and have needed an outstanding team. There are more than 200 nurses and many dozens of junior and senior medical staff who look after these children at the bedside in the ICU and on the cardiology ward. 
At the core of this extended team lies the VAD team, and this includes our surgeons, led here by Igor and Ben. Within cardiology, I'm supported by my colleagues Lucas and Bennett and our fellow Dorothy. Within the intensive care unit, a number of um, ICU doctors are involved in this program, and particularly Roberto and Johnny, who are shown here. And we need extensive um, help and the expertise of our colleagues in haematology, including Anthea, who leads the program and unfortunately isn't pictured here, Sally and Gemma. But at the core of this all, um, this whole program, our excellent CNC nurses um, really do hold this all together and led capably by Caitlin, who you'll also hear from. Now, the road ahead does hold some challenges for us. Our environment is one of low donor availability, lengthening waiting times, and at the same time we're seeing increased numbers of patients referred for us and increased resource utilisation with this. The landscape is becoming very complex and it's driven by technology. And as I've alluded to in the last slide, navigating all of this successfully needs for us to have an excellent team and excellent coordination. Our donor environment in Australia has always been a challenge. Because of some very hard work by organisations like Donate Life, the overall rate of organ donation in Australia has almost doubled in the last decade. However, while this is true for adult donors, as we see in orange here, we have not seen the same in uh, paediatric donation rates. And this blue line represents those donors under 50 kilograms who are much more likely to be suitable for our patients. Despite population growth, we see that the absolute number of donors has barely changed and may even have fallen a little since the early 1990s. Our second challenge is one of geography. Hearts that are donated can only be safely stored for four to six hours after donation, and this limits the distance for retrieval, a challenge in a country like Australia. This map represents where each of the donors has come from over the 30 years of our program, and not nicely depicts the challenge that this poses. Because of increased referrals and our patients having to wait longer for a heart in this era, it's not been uncommon to have up to a dozen patients on VAD at any time in the hospital. And that's reflected here in this chart, which shows the explosion in um, time in hospitals uh, spent by these patients. Separately to resourcing and logistic issues, each point on this graph is a day a child spends in hospital, away from their home and away from their extended family and supports. So with these challenges in mind, let's look at some of the possible solutions that might be on the horizon for us. Firstly, to address the donor and geographic issues, we'll be enrolling patients shortly in a trial of an organ preservation device that may allow hearts to be transported safely for longer periods of time than was possible previously. Despite this, it's likely that some children will wait for a long time for their right heart to come along, and we'll soon be trying to make this portion of their journey a little bit smoother by introducing this portable driver for the Berlin heart, which, as you can see, can be hooked onto the back of a pram or can be carried in a portable caddy, and it has a much longer battery life than its predecessor. The hope is to offer our smaller patients a much better mobility and freedom around the hospital than was possible before. And perhaps in time we may also be able to allow some of these smaller children to leave hospital while waiting for transplants. We will be replacing the Heartware device, which I've shown before, with a similar but newer adult device called the HeartMate 3, which has been associated with a much lower incidents of complications like stroke in the adults and larger children who've been supported on this device so far. And again, to make this work, we need to have a well-functioning and tightly coordinated team. And this is probably a good opportunity for me to hand over to Caitlin, who will describe some of the fantastic work that she's been doing with her nurses in this space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Um, that was a really, really useful way to see the impact that the philanthropies had. Um, the improvement in care of our transplant kids has been amazing. Um, I'm really annoyed that your slides look so much better than mine. <laughs> but um, you may have noticed I've gone to mood lighting in the in the hospital at the moment. It's because the the, the lighting's gone off to save energy. 
but I'm okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> our next presenter is going to be Caitlin. So that's a really, really good segue to talking about um, uh, how nursing empowerment is important to us. So we could see um, Caitlin's video now, please. Um, Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm so honoured to be here speaking to you all today and to be representing the nursing workforce. I just want to say thank you to all of you because it is your generosity and support that makes a difference between us being a good hospital and a great hospital. So thank you. I absolutely love nursing and as a nurse I'm clearly slightly biased but I strongly believe that nurses are the backbone to this hospital. We are the front line of care and the ones that are at the bedside every minute of the day, not only interacting with all the teams involved, but caring for these children with all we have to give emotionally and intellectually. We are there to make a child smile after their first day post-cardiac surgery. We are there to alert and to assess when a child is requiring escalation of care. We're there to comfort the parents when they receive bad news as well as to share in the joys of all the triumphs, no matter how big or small. It is a role that is very caring and nurturing, but it is also a role that comes with a lot of responsibility and requires highly skilled professionals. The Royal Children's is a leading hospital in the world, but we need to be innovative and offer educational opportunities to nurses to help evolve our nursing model to maintain the excellence that we pride ourselves on here at the Royal Children's. 337,816. That is the number of registered nurses in Australia. 2,212. That's the number of nurse practitioners in Australia, which I'll explain what that is in a moment. Now that may sound like a lot of nurse practitioners, but that is less than 1% of the nursing workforce. Out of the 2,212 nurse practitioners, we have zero in paediatric cardiology. Our department here tonight believe this is a problem and one we're wanting to change. Very quickly, for those of you that may not know, a nurse practitioner is the most clinically advanced a nurse can become and requires advanced university education at master's level. Simply put, a nurse practitioner role involves a hybrid advanced nursing model of care which includes a combination of nursing care, diagnostic activities, intervention-based treatments and prescribing medications as well as providing support and education to nurses and the junior medical staff. Traditionally, some of these activities have been limited to the scope of doctors. This is a government-endorsed role protected by legislation, which has four competency standards that govern the framework, as you can see on the screen. All of this is in the name of delivering higher quality patient care. I am so passionate about bringing nurse practitioners to paediatric cardiology in Australia that I am even happy to show some embarrassing photos of myself for the cause. On the left is me on my first day as a nurse in 2011 on the cardiac ward at the Royal Children's. A very proud day for me as I was realising my professional dream of becoming a paediatric nurse. Very quickly I found that I love caring for cardiac children and my passion for cardiac nursing was ignited. On the right is me five years later working at Great Ormond Street Hospital in England where I spent the next four years. It was at Great Ormond Street Hospital where I first came across a nurse practitioner. I was able to work alongside this highly trained and skillful group of nurse practitioners in the cardiac ward and the intensive care unit and I saw firsthand the benefits this model of care had on the organisation, nursing and medical teams and more importantly on the patients and families. I was inspired and was certain this was the future of nursing. This led me to do some research. What other paediatric cardiology hospitals around the world had implemented nurse practitioners? Frankly, I was quite surprised the majority of the leading cardiology paediatric hospitals in the world were all utilising this model of care, including Sick Kids in Toronto, Texas Children's and Boston Children's, just to name a few. And not only did they have nurse practitioners, but they had well-established nurse practitioner programs within their department for decades. Why was Australia, and in particular the Royal Children's, not adopting this advanced model of care in cardiology? This question sat at the back of my mind while I worked in England. 
In 2019, I moved back to Australia and was fortunate enough to come back to the Royal Children's and here I am working with this amazing team. Since moving back with the support of Michael and the, and the consultant group, in particular Jacob Matthew and Robert Weintrope, I'm a few months off completing my nurse practitioner master's degree, which will result in the first cardiology paediatric nurse practitioner in Australia. The vision is to have multiple nurse practitioners in the department and on the cardiac ward at the Royal Children's. We are so fortunate to have a progressive and courageous director and consultant team who are very supportive and engaged in making this vision a reality. But we need your help to see this through. Before I go into the how, I just want to touch on why we should implement nurse practitioners into our cardiology department. The nurse practitioner role has existed for many decades, which means we have research studies evaluating the benefits of the nurse practitioner model. The research shows the benefits are plentiful. There are direct patient benefits, such as reducing the length of stay in a hospital and improved clinical outcomes. And additionally, there are several benefits for the organisation and nursing group, such as staff retention, increased job satisfaction and nurse empowerment all of which reduces the cost for the hospital and the burden on doctors. Most importantly, all of these benefits resolved in improved quality of care for our patients, the children. To bring this closer to home and to give an example, the Royal Children's introduced a nurse practitioner into the immunisation department. The introduction of the nurse practitioner saw an improvement in vaccination rates by 140% within one year. The Royal Children's Emergency Department has 16 employed nurse practitioners. These nurse practitioners have been instrumental in developing the Emergency Rapid Program, which reduces patient wait times, enhances patient access to care, and improves communication with families. As you can see, there are lots of benefits. I haven't gone through them all and have only touched the surface, but what it really comes down to is this. These beautiful, resilient, strong, courageous and special kids. The nurse practitioner model provides the best quality of nursing care for these children, ensuring we continue to reach one of the royal children's core values of providing excellent care. I just want to pause here for a moment so we can take in these beautiful photos. So what's our plan to implement this? It starts with being able to educate more nurses by funding the master's degree in order for them to become a nurse practitioner. This also involves creating nurse practitioner candidate roles. At the completion of the degree, we would then like to create and fund more nurse practitioner roles within our department. I hope my love for nursing has come through as I really do love what I do and I have many nursing colleagues who are fortunate enough to love their job but we need to be innovative and keep up with the advancements in nursing models of care, not only to provide development opportunities for nurses to ensure job satisfaction and staff retention, but to also provide a model of care that can positively impact patients and families. It really is all about providing the best for these children, and we cannot do that without the generous and ever impactful support from our donors. On behalf of the patients and the nursing team, sincerely, thank you. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, as you know, I've been trying to push this for a number of years and I'm just so grateful that somebody like you has come back into the unit to take this on. Um, and clearly we need more people like you to, to drive this program. Um, it's, it, as you say, it's been around for a few years elsewhere and we've been fortunate of those of us who've worked or trained overseas to see the benefits of it. And clearly it would be great if we could get more support for that here at the Children's. Um, just a reminder for people, if you are able to submit some questions into the chat, then uh, we will field those later on. Um, I've just been told by the director to sit up straighter, so I'll try and do that. And um, <laughs> finally, we'll move on to the last presentation of the evening. That's going to be from Remy Kowalski, and uh, we have a short video from him as well. Thanks very much for letting me come and chat to you guys tonight about some of the advances in heart imaging techniques we're using in our department, uh, both in our clinical and research programs. So imaging, in other words, taking pictures of the heart and the blood vessels is key to our everyday clinical work. 
And the mainstay of this, uh, of course, is ultrasound, which we refer to as echocardiography when it's looking at the heart. But increasingly, we also use newer techniques like uh, MRI scan uh, of uh, the cardiac structures, which gives us a great perspective on not only the heart muscle, but also the blood vessels. Over recent years, the sophistication of these techniques has evolved dramatically. And now we have powerful tools which enable us to extract much more information from the data that we are acquiring from our patients. And this aids us both in diagnosis of difficult conditions as well as in our research programs. So I thought I'd start with a quick case to show you how we're applying some of these new techniques in our day-to-day -day clinical work. Sarah is a 15-year-old uh, young lady, that's not her real name of course, and she presented to our department with recurrent chest pain. Blood tests that were taken initially suggested that she had damage of her actual heart muscle, much like you'd see in a 60 or 70 year old adult having a heart attack. But there was no obvious cause. Her blood vessels looked wide open, there were no obvious viruses that would usually cause a problem like this, and when we looked at the function of her heart with our regular ultrasound machine, it looked normal. So in this sort of scenario, we would usually leverage the power of MRI to have a look at the heart muscle in more detail, to hopefully show us what the cause and consequences of tissue damage uh, can be to the heart. And usually this scenario would be explained by some sort of inflammation, perhaps caused by a virus or some other explanation. Now, only a few years ago, this is about as sophisticated as that assessment could have been. You see here there is a cross-section of the heart outlined between the red and the green lines is the heart muscle. And we would look at the strength of that signal and say, oh yeah, gee, that's a bit bright, and think, oh yeah, a bit, a bit bright, that's probably inflammation. But really the degree of sophistication we were able to apply to the question was pretty minimal. These days, with our new techniques, which we are applying with software that was partially acquired through foundation and philanthropic funds, we are able to take these analyses to the next level. You see in these two panels, there is examples of inflammation of the heart uh, with the blue color, and with the yellow color on the other side, scarring of the heart. And we can see that the inflammation shown here in blue and the scarring are both in the same regions. Taking it even further, we are able to now put markers on the heart itself and trace its motion throughout the cardiac cycle. By doing that, we can appreciate in this video that although the heart function looks normal, if you look very carefully, when the heart squeezes and turns the dark blue colour, one part of the heart doesn't move as well as the others and still stays a light blue colour. And this is exactly the same region where we saw scar and inflammation. We can then apply this type of calculation over the entire heart from the top to the bottom and then produce a map which shows us which parts of the heart are affected by this problem and we can correlate the inflammation and the swelling we see to the subtle changes in heart function which probably five or ten years ago would not have been apparent to us. In this case this young woman's recurrent chest pain was inflammatory and it turned out to be because of an unusual genetic change which affects her heart muscle. Now separate to these techniques for imaging of heart muscle, we also have patients that have very complicated anatomy and we can apply some of these powerful techniques now to the imaging of blood vessels and blood flow. Lots of our patients have unusual blood vessels, they might be narrowed, they might be crossing the wrong way and this leads to an inefficient flow of blood out of the heart and poor output to the body leading to poor oxygen supply to the organs. Modelling the blood flow and pressure in vessels even in normal vessels, is extraordinarily complex. The mathematics that underpins how blood flows through a flexible tube is something that uh, only uh, higher level mathematicians really understand. But with technologies that we're able to use and apply to our patients, we've led some new developments in this area, which are important uh, when we apply them to clinical practice. This example that I want to show you now is just what the blood flow in a normal aorta is. The aorta is the major blood vessel that comes out of the heart. And you can see on the left panel there is a video showing the complex flow patterns that occur even in a normal aorta. 
we can now model these by looking at how the area of the blood vessel changes in relation to its flow. And this gives us a unique understanding in how blood waves travel through the vessels. And this helps our surgeons particularly devise some of the better techniques to improve the blood flow for our patients. We are leading uh, the world in some of this research. Another example here is to show you how we can now apply real-time four-dimensional flow, that's what it's called, where we can track individual blood particles and model how they flow through an aorta. Here is an example of a normal aorta, the major artery that comes out of the heart. And you can see that the blood flow is fairly smooth and spirals in a nice natural way as it comes around the corner of the aorta. Here, in a patient that's had surgery, however, we can see a lot of disturbance in the blood flow where there's been a narrowing in the aorta. And this has led to a large ballooning out of the wall of the artery up towards the head. When we apply some further analysis to this, we can see that there is a lot of strain in the wall of that aorta, which is causing that ongoing billowing and ballooning of the blood vessel. And you could imagine that in a few more years that might continue to grow and become at risk of rupture. The final example I thought I'd show you today is how we can model how our surgical results lead to distribution of blood flow in a patient's body. In this particular example, uh, a young lady has had what we call a Fontan operation, which is the operation done for children who are missing half their heart. As a result of that operation, blood flows by itself without a pump to the lungs from the top and the bottom of the body. But it's crucial that the blood flow from the top and from the bottom is equally distributed to the two sides. Now, with our 4D flow MRI and analytical technology, we can demonstrate in almost real time and show how the blood is distributed from both sides of the body. And this, again, is key information that we can relay to our surgical colleagues when they plan their operations. So just to summarise this quick cook's tour of some of the advanced techniques that we're using, we, both in our clinical and research programs, are at the cutting edge of some of these novel imaging techniques when applied to children with congenital heart disease. And this work to date has relied heavily on philanthropic and research funding. There are exciting clinical and research opportunities that have arisen from this work and will continue to come from it. And we'd like to thank you for your ongoing support. Thank you, Remy, so very much. Really insightful presentation. And also to Caitlin and Jacob, uh, re three really, really interesting presentations. And I think what we can see is uh, what the, uh, Michael and his team have put together really illustrates what Michael was talking about before, about the, the interactions between uh, great care and the great people that need to deliver it, um, research and its link to great care and the capacity to develop on from there, and also education and training, um, and then through the uh, once again in the care with um, with great equipment. So Jacob talked to us about the incredible uh, work that we can now do with the ventricular. Um, uh, assisted devices and, and the sort of importance of of the, uh, those sorts of pieces of equipment. We heard with Remy uh, the sort of you know the, the leading edge we can be at when we use research with, some, with with imaging, and then of course with Caitlin we heard just how incredibly important it is to have great people. But even Kate, in Caitlin's presentation, you can hear how research has led her to become um, a greater clinician, a better clinician as well. So Michael, thank you so much. I think that was a wonderful. Uh, way of, of looking at and drawing together all of those things, equipment, great clinical care, research and, um, and the great people. Uh, so um, wonderful to hear from people. So we're now going to hand things back to you, our audience, folks. It's now your opportunity uh, to ask any questions of our cardiology team, and there are some great things coming up on my, uh, my screen down here. Just to remind you, type all your questions into the chat function and select all attendees and panellists.
Um, I've got a terrific uh, comment here from the new hospital uh, CEO, Bernadette MacDonald. It's day two for Bernadette, and Bernadette, we're so thrilled that you would you would join us. I'm going to come right back to that now, but I'm going to give Remy, Caitlin and Jacob um, uh, some time to think about three questions that I wanted to pose uh, to our panellists at home. So I'm going to ask these three questions. It's going to give time for Remy, Caitlin and Jacob to type them in, and we'll come back to them as we go. So, Remy, um, we're interested to know what a significant philanthropic gift would mean for cardiovascular imaging. Caitlin, we'd like to know what is the best part of your role or work at the RCH. And Jacob, it's really hard for us to imagine a child experiencing heart failure. Can you talk to us about what role research plays in advancing care techniques? So we'll leave, uh, we'll leave our guests to ponder on those for a minute. Um, pretty good questions, Michael, I reckon. Uh, and so I just, I'll read out. Um, Bernadette, again, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, Bernadette says, he's so great to hear about the fantastic work of this wonderful team. As the new CEO at RCH, I am so proud of the teams and as a nurse, very supportive of great nursing roles. So, Caitlin, you've, you've, had, a big, you've had a big win there tonight. Okay, um, I have a few... Oh, Jacob has responded already. Um, Barry, I'm going to come back to you. Jacob's responded already. Um, heart transplant keeps children with heart failure to enjoy a good quality of life. In the longer term, most of our children are physically in good condition and can attend uh, school or work normally. Life is a little medical in that they do need to take medicines every day and they need to see us in clinic every few months. But they live lives, pretty full lives in between. So while average survival is shorter than normal life expectancy, it's measured in decades and continues to improve over time. Did you want to add anything to that, Michael, on, on that matter of... Um, of advancing care techniques? I, I, I think what um, yeah, all, all of that is true. You know, we think about the long-term outcomes of our kids. There are multiple elements to their long-term development and interactions with family, which I think are incredibly important. The VADs have obviously improved our success rates in getting to transplantation, as uh, Jacob clearly showed. I think one element of longer-term care, which is it, it's not only restricted to transplant patients, but it's all of our kids with chronic diseases, is their interaction with their family and peers and how they develop that ability to cope with chronic disease. So those are elements I think that we perhaps in the past hadn't thought about because we were purely a children's hospital or a children's service. But clearly now as we're involved in the adults with um, chronic conditions much more, I'm thinking more about that as a, as a long-term outcome measure for us. Yeah, so we're changing, aren't we, over time? The more success we have, the greater challenges we then have. Exactly. And, and, and that, got, that is in this area as well. Exactly. So um, we have, uh, amongst our callers tonight, we have a former chairman of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation and current chair of RCH1000, Barry Novi. Barry, welcome. Um, uh, Barry's asked a question, what is the longer-range outlook for infants and young children who have undergone heart transplants? And how long does it differ today from, say, compared 10 or 20 years ago? Michael. Um, I, th I think Jacob's answer may have partly gone towards that, mm. Barry, and I hope that's answered a lot of your, your questions there. Clearly, as our immunosuppression techniques have improved, we're able to better protect the heart, having the heart in a better condition when it first arrives and the patient coming or being rehabilitated was essentially what our VAD systems allow us to do have meant that our long-term outcomes should be better. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, and uh, Carolyn, um, Jacoby on the call, um, very interested to know what are the costs involved in developing the nurse practitioner program? So, Michael, seeing as we're live to you, um, I guess that's a terrific question to know, you know, what can we, how can we, how can we have an impact? Um, clearly, there, there are multiple elements of that. There's the 
course and that's a master's degree through the university we're very fortunate that we have other nurse practitioners who have driven the course here at the children's hospital and whilst caitlin said we don't have any cardiac nurse practitioners we do have a few in other departments through emergency departments and through our neonatal units Mm. so the 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 masters of nurse practitioners has been driven through our own staff which is that it's great to see that we're leading in that area um so there's the masters the cost of the masters and that's supported um for uh, certain groups of people uh, through the hospital and there are scholarships for that i think the next step though is how we incorporate them into the workforce and there are certainly elements of that that we would require ongoing support for mm-hmm. how that what their role would be on the wards and no, this is actually a slightly delicate issue because obviously we have training requirements or obligations for junior doctors as well. We can slot them in together, though. We can integrate them because I think the, medic- the, the junior doctors would benefit significantly from having a nurse practitioner guide them through our protocols. They understand us very, very well in our, our systems and how we practice. Mm-hmm. So I think actually they would benefit from it and shouldn't feel threatened by somebody else coming in and working alongside them. Mm-hmm. And clearly collaboration is incredibly important for us to provide good health care. Mm-hmm. I, I know we've uh, we've certainly the foundations funded nurse practitioners um, absolutely in Butterfly Ward uh, over a considerable length of time, and it was that mm-hmm. making it work in the ward that was the thing that philanthropy was really able um, to support. I think, yeah. uh, although we've we've certainly provided um, support for um, ongoing and upskilling of training of nurses over the years as well. So, um, I, you know, someone else has noted here: how, how can we, you know, if we've got a lot of nurse practitioners in some areas, why not in cardiology? right now I don't know whether you want to reflect on on you know um, coming a little late to it or just it's no, presented when, itself now when, when I say there's a lot I mean we essentially have two departments that have nurse practitioners and there are certain requirements that are, are necessary for nurse practitioners to get into that um, into that role it's depending on career time in your career having to take time out to go back to study mm-hmm. is an impediment for some people and clearly if we get people at the right time with the right ideas who've seen the potential that's a much easier process to to start off mm-hmm. and so maybe it was a timing thing uh, maybe it's the new hospital that allowed us to do it a bit more and maybe it's a change in thinking across the hospital too which is mm-hmm. very exciting for mm-hmm. us and I think, Michael, you'd also suggest, I suppose, it, it, it's often um, it's often sort of led from the from the nurse, isn't it? As well, it's like you know, we we see the need, we see, and this is what we were hearing in Caitlin's presentation, wasn't it? Really, was was um, the need becomes apparent as you develop your career. Um, it is. We're getting terrific message from our supporters because we've got one here from Remy saying. Um, uh, you know, keep up the great work, um, Caitlin, you know, great presentation. Let, let's get more nurse practitioners. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty fantastic, really. Thank you, Rennie, um, for, saying, for saying that. Uh, so um, I've got a lovely response. Caitlin's written her response now uh, about what is the best part of your work. And while we're, we're talking nurses, we may as well keep with the theme, Michael. What do you think? Uh, so Caitlin's written, it's probably a bit of a cliché, but I genuinely love a lot of my role, which makes me very lucky. However, however, if I had to narrow it down, I would say it is being able to work closely with the families and patients to try and provide them with the best care and to try and ease their journeys in any way possible. It's an extremely rewarding part of my job. I also really like the leadership role and building a team. And I really love developing and educating the nursing team, plus trying to encourage people to try and be the best versions of themselves. Extraordinary response, Caitlin. Thank you so very much. That is just fantastic. I think it shows, I think, to everybody on the call just how passionate our nurses are. And um, we, I think, you know, as we've seen our... Um, our medical, our clinicians come into, and our researchers come into our lounge rooms over the last 18 months. Um, and we're seeing so much of the pressure that everybody, Michael, including yourself, everybody in the hospital is um, under at the moment. Uh, it, it shines through that passion because you all couldn't be what, doing what you're doing. Uh, in the world that we live in right now uh, without that incredible passion. So thank you. 
And I'm going to come to uh, Rem, Remy's question now, which was um, always a bit cheeky on our part, but that's why we're here. What would a significant philanthropic gift mean for cardiovascular imaging? And um, so not surprising, he says, thanks for the question, Sue. It would enable us to apply some of the techniques discussed today in day -to -day care, tonight in day-to-day -day care, which we're not always able to do currently as routine funding doesn't extend to these more significant analyses. Doing this work takes a lot of analysis time, training, sophisticated hardware, software and data storage, all of which are only possible with philanthropic support. Can you just talk to us a little bit about what a day in your world, you know, in your life looks like professionally? Yes, my you. Work. Yes, you. Well, you know, I, I was talking to my, my over dinner with the kids the other day and they said, um, what's it what's it like? for you these days in in the in the um, covid environment and i was saying that um well the kids were actually saying to me that dad even in covid times your that your day is really not any different <laughs> our, our lives as as medical practitioners as healthcare workers in pediatrics hasn't actually changed that much mm. so i understand the stresses that are going on in the in the, in society and in melbourne in particular with all our lockdowns but actually, we're pretty fortunate in being able to come to work and do the things that we love to do and be around people that we, we gen generally like and uh, certainly the patients that we love. So day to day, we're still doing the same things. Um, COVID hasn't changed what we do particularly. Obviously, it's complicated the resources and allocation. And currently, with the being in the acting chief of surgery position, it's, it's very, very interesting to see the demands on healthcare and the yeah. system in general. Yeah. We're, we've been pretty lucky so far, and I am a bit worried about the next few months and how that's going to impact us. But generally speaking, in the past 18 months, our activity hasn't changed significantly. And, and importantly, we've been able to keep everybody safe, mm. all of our staff very safe. So that, that's been very important to us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and folks, we're, we're fast um, coming up to the end of our time, but Michael, I did want to ask you two other quick questions. Um, the first would be, how important is the relationship between the department, your cardiology, and the foundation in terms of helping meet your philanthropic needs? Um, well, so we know we've, we've known each other for a long time, and uh, actually not that long. <laughs> <laughs> The CVs are getting longer for both of us, Michael. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but, you know, I've, I've always said that we're very lucky at the Children's Hospital that we're, we're in a privileged position within society. But and Australian hospitals overall are looked after very well. Um, and certainly when you go overseas and see what happens in the NHS or um, in North America, we're, we're pretty well off in terms of the support that we get. But when it comes to things like this, where we're really trying to push the boundaries outside of the regular, outside of the expected, that's when we need the help of the foundation. Mm. And so with the research stuff, the additional hardware, software, people, and the technology, that's where the foundation is incredibly helpful to us to kickstart these new projects. And then we can make them grow into something much more sustainable, which is our responsibility to do that. But I think the foundation's responsibility is allow us that seed funding to start off these new exciting ideas and new programs and improve quality. Yeah. That's how I see our relationship yeah. is really strong and really helpful. Yeah, thank you. And the one last question which we, we, we like to ask at, at all of these events, if you could imagine for me, Michael, that a donor comes along and says, we'd like to give you a million dollars tomorrow, what would you, how would you use the funds? Um, uh, that's a very hard question, Sue. You know, <laughs> I, it's almost like trying to choose between your three children here. I've got oh. three different areas, <laughs> which I am really, really keen to do and, and support. But I hope what you've seen is that there are, there are, it's an integration of several different elements that helps us provide great care. And it's, it's a different triangle to the great care triangle. Mm. But we need all three of these elements to provide something really good. The other thing I'd like to just point out is that all of the people who we've heard speaking tonight have been going through our system. And so we need that foundation of people that we have I'm not suggesting that we've grown them, but we've selected and been able to attract really good people that are now leading in those areas, which mm. I think are important. Mm. So that's been, obviously that takes time and that's been a long time 
process. I mean, I think when I first came here, we'd had one local trainee who joined our cardiology program, mm. one trainee mm. over the course of 10 years. Mm. And now we're attracting a lot of very good young people into the specialty. Uh, I don't know what's changed particularly over the past 15 years, but majority of our trainees, as well as the international guys who want to come and be with us and learn from us, um, a lot of our consultants now have been through our own system, which is a major flip from where we used to be, where we were always looking outside for staff to come in. So I think that's been a really important role that not only the foundations played but the hospital has played in in building our department mm, so I'm, I'm really proud of that yeah thank you and we're, we're we're really proud of it too michael we're very proud of the the contribution that our donors and that we can make um to cardiology uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to, we're going to wrap up at this point. Um, I think there's been some great dialogue on the chat, which you've had the opportunity to read this pro- um, as we've gone through. Um, I, I would just there's a lovely um, final kind of comment here from uh, from Tom Connell, who's in the executive on the hospital. Um, excellent presentations from the team. All the presentations really complemented each other. Um, the potential for children to spend time at at, uh, at home in the future, perhaps through hospital in the home, has you know is, is also very real. Um, and so, Tom, thank you so much for that kind of reinforcement of the presentations tonight and the connection between what we're doing, uh, what the clinicians and researchers are doing here, but what the future looks like as well in perhaps something more like uh, in the home and virtual care. So, ladies and gentlemen, that does bring us to a close tonight. I hope you've had uh, a really great opportunity to both listen to the presentations, uh, listen to the questions, and also uh, read some of those other responses that we didn't quite get to. Can I take this opportunity to thank our very special guests again one more time? Professor Michael Chung. Michael, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Matt Saban, who introduced for us. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jacob Matthew. Ms. Caitlin Elliott and Dr. Remy Kowalski. It is so fantastic uh, to learn more about the incredible impact that our donors and many of those generous supporters are on the call tonight have had on the cardiology department Um, and more importantly the way that support translates into patient care today uh, right now as well as planning for the future. So finally to all of you our passionate generous supporters thank you so much for your generosity thank you so much for being part of the foundation family and for being a part of the community of practice that really helps this hospital be the great hospital that it is as you've heard through the event your support is truly changing the lives of our sickest of children and young people Um, and so that's changing it now and into the future and by giving you're having a direct impact on the future of children's health through groundbreaking research If you'd like to know more about how you can support the Royal Children's Hospital, particularly in cardiology, please don't hesitate to contact our team. We've put their details in the chat function below. I hazard a guess that everybody on the call knows every one of the team members. But thank you, do reach out to us, and I'm always at the end of a phone call as well. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our Spotlight series on the impact of philanthropy in cardiology. We hope you've enjoyed the uh, the technological, the full-on technological version of this. Michael, thank you so much for, for coping with us. Um, and to everyone in Creative Studio and to everybody in my team who's made this happen tonight, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all stay safe and stay well. Um, and for those of you who are going into Yom Kippur tomorrow night, uh, may you have a meaningful fast. Thank you, everybody. Good night.